um, come on up, Luis. Um, Thank, you. Thank you. So welcome to Talks at Google. We have about 800 folks on the live stream uh, from Mountain View, Seattle, Chicago, New York City, and hopefully Washington, D.C., my home office. Um, it's a treat to have you, uh, Luce, here today. Pleasure. And Luce, your wife, um, Lynn Manuel's mom, uh, here with us today, and that you've been a part of kind of the conversation that we've been having around bringing students into this experience and how we can use and leverage technology uh, to do so. A little bit about your background, uh, which I think is super fascinating, and I think as we think about how your life and experience and legacy connects to the work that Lynn Manuel has done, we'll talk a little bit about that today. You've worked, you're from New York City. Uh, worked I'm from Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, yes, but have spent <laughs> the last, last 30, 40 years of your life in New York City working for three mayors, yeah. uh, Giuliani, uh, Co Koch, Ed Koch, yes. and um, David Dinkins. You were the founding president of the Hispanic. And thank you for making me 10 years younger, <laughs> 44 years. 44 in New York. years. Okay, it must have been an old bio. Uh, you were the founding president of the Hispanic Federation, one of the country's largest uh, and what I would say most impactful Latino organizations out of New York City, serving Latinos in, in New York and in Florida. Um, you founded a, a political consulting firm called the Miram Group, um, where you've worked on lots of successful campaigns, including Senator Clinton, Senator Schumer, and Senator Gillibrand in, in New York. Um, so we're so glad to have you here, and we really want to talk today a little bit about politics, uh, history and legacy, and really um, community empowerment and kind of the role that you've played in that and how uh, the work that Lynn manuel is doing through his work is helping to do that for so many. So um, I was mentioning to you in the green room that we first met in 2009, um, the summer of 2009, when President Obama nominated uh, Justice Sotomayor to uh, the Supreme Court. She handed me a list of people who were going to help get her confirmed, who were going to help to provide validation of, of her kind of contribution to the community in New York and nationally. And at the top of that list was your name, um, along with about a dozen other very prominent uh, New York uh, political leaders. So let's start there. How did you become so involved uh, in politics and community well, empowerment? I, I, I don't recall ever not being in a campaign. Uh, my family, it's a very political family in Puerto Rico, more so then than now. We had, you know, for those of you who know a little bit about Puerto Rico, there's always politics. Everything is politics in Puerto Rico. And we had people in different parties who had run for Senate, and Bayonco is the founder of the Puerto Rican Independence Party. So we, we were always in a campaign. So it was logical then when I came to New York at 18, uh, in 73, uh, to get involved. Uh, initially, uh, in the Puerto Rican Socialist Party, I saw Claridad, which was the paper of the Puerto Rican Socialist Party in the streets of the Lower East Side, and then sort of little by little sort of mainstream myself into democratic politics. So I, I don't recall ever not being involved in a campaign. And that's why my views are also a bit to the left uh, <laughs> than, than most of my contemporaries. Do you remember what that issue was that you read in La Claridad or what, that, what really drove you to want to get involved? Uh, every issue, uh, you know, in, injustice just pisses me off. <laughs> uh, it doesn't energize me, it pisses me off and it makes me have to do something about it. Many times my wife will tell me, someone it's been unjust in the street in some dispute and I, I want to intervene. Mm -hmm. And she's like, the hell, just be, let it be. Uh, so uh, probably injustice is what pushes my buttons. Right, and I think that that's, Part of what's so beautiful in your relationship with an influence on, on Lynn Manuel's kind of creativity in his career, um, because we're all products of our family history and the legacies mm -hmm. of, of our parents and their struggles and, and what they fought to be, right? And Lynn Manuel has talked about your involvement in politics and how that made him more uh, woke, right? Like to what was happening in the world around him and the injustice that was happening in the world around him. 
And so talk about um, kind of how you think your civic engagement and political participation. I even read that I think you recruited at when Lynn Manuel was a lot younger to do a jingle for one of the campaigns that oh. you. Um, you know, that we, were... We, we were we always worried. Uh, we don't worry anymore. But we always worried how he was going to pay his next meal and rent. <laughs> he could have been uh, a lawyer. Imagine that. That would have been a travesty been. for society. I, I, I thought that Reuben Blades was the perfect example. <laughs> Graduate, law, Harvard, and a singer, a famous <laughs> one. I, I figured, and I kept telling him, you could be like Reuben Blades. You could go to law school, become a lawyer, and then have this gig until that gig takes off. Yeah. The gig took off before the, the, the law part. Uh, but <laughs> Were you ever worried? You were worried? <laughs> Oh, I, we were always for it, and that's why any time I had a gig in my office, something that I knew he could do, uh, we will tell him to write this jingle, write this piece of music, and then we will pay him. Uh, now I actually have the copyrights to all of those that I paid <laughs> 500 I bucks. Know which, I want to know which candidates. More. I want to know which candidates have their. They should. They should. That. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, he he remembers. Uh, he did uh, jingles for Elliot Spitzer, uh, <laughs> and when Elliot, who's a friend, sort of got into a bit of trouble uh, and had to resign from the governorship. Uh, Lin Manuel asked me, "Didn't I do a jingle for him?" <laughs> I said, "You did." <laughs> well, so folks, start getting your questions ready because we're going to open up to audience Q and A here in a minute. But um, you know, you spent a lot of your time. You helped to found the Hispanic Hispanic Federation, as I mentioned, one of the country's largest Latino advocacy organizations. What do you think is kind of the current state? of play for the Latino community oh, in New York and in the United States Remember I told right you now. <laughs> yeah. Pissed me off. Yeah. Trump, it's the embodiment of injustice. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I just think that this guy is such a nightmare. It's unbelievable that we're still days away from 100 days. I was counting the other day 1,340 more days to go. Uh, and, and I think I'm going to do a clock or something in my room to sort of go one by one and, and sort of feel a little better. It, it sort of reminds me a bit of, uh, I don't know how many of you uh, read 100 Years of Solitude mm -hmm. of Gabriel Garcia Marquez, a 1967 novel. And the family is the Buendia family where mm -hmm. he creates his own Macondo town. Yeah. So, I feel all the time like I'm in Macondo that Trump creates his own lies, his own reality, his own mm -hmm. shit. Mm -hmm. And somehow we're supposed to swallow it. So I, all of that to say that we must redouble efforts. Uh, when Luz and I, when my wife and I were having breakfast this morning, I was telling her that I always thought that, OK, I am as busiest as I can get. Mm -hmm. But every time something else comes up and I take it on, and somehow you're able to do it because we're able to do many, many things. And I think that every single one of us during the next 1,342 days uh, need to do even more mm -hmm. uh, to sort of move the community forward and, and fight this avalanche of crap. Yeah. Uh, that this misguided government has on us. Right, right. Not that I have an opinion about it. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me how you really feel. Um, <laughs> so before I open it up to Q&A, I'll ask one last quick question. Um, I think, and I've kind of seen you do interviews with Lin-Manuel and, and you and your wife interacting uh, with him, and I think it's a very, we were just kind of talking back there about uh, you know, your daughter and son as, as kids, and you know, this beautiful relationship of, of, I think, admiration and respect and what really seems like friendship that you guys have, which is, is a beautiful thing to, to see. Seems very grounded in kind of where he comes from and, and what you fought for um, that's really beautiful. Um, 
So uh, back in 2009, kind of the, the famous uh, anecdote around when he first debuted Hamilton at the White House at uh -huh. the Poetry Slam uh, with President Obama and uh, First Lady, then Mich First Lady Michelle Obama. From a, from a father's point of view, or a parent's point of view, kind of talk about how you have seen him um, from In the Heights to Hamilton to writing music for Moana and now Mary Poppins. Like, what, what have you seen about his work style and like how he struggled and what is, you know, from a First, my shot was not supposed to be the number in the White House. I had gotten a call from David Axelrod, with whom I had done campaigns, and he had just finished doing uh, the Obama campaign. Uh, you know, they said, you know, he's the first lady is having this night, and can Lin Manuel do a number from In the Heights because mm -hmm. he had gotten the Tommy yep. uh, for In the Heights, and so I told Lin Manuel, we invited the White House, they want a number from In the Heights. And it's like, do you? think that I could do this number that I, and I stop him, I said, no, <laughs> you can't. They want a number from In the Heights. But, to, and I have learned, uh, and more and more as he gets older, to trust his judgment. He is such a mature soul. And I said, you know, I mean, it's my own crap, let me, uh, uh, what, what is it that you want me to send to the White House? <laughs> said, so I'm going to send you the lyrics, and I sent you the music uh, to this song uh, that I just wrote. So I sent it to them, and they loved it. <laughs> Not only did they ask him to do it, but he closed the mm -hmm, night mm -hmm. uh, with my shot, which had never been anywhere before. But he tells you, not only that, that I trust his judgment, but to his own creativity, that he knew many, many, many years ago, now we know where Hamilton is, that there was something special mm -hmm. about this music. So I have learned through uh, the years to sort of trust his judgment. And when I fight back, and I do often, uh, Half of the time, he ends up convincing me that his way is the best way for him. Mm -hmm. And he will, because he's actually very sweet that way, he'll say, for you, <laughs> this is the best course of action. For me, this is the best course of action. So we, we, we have grown to sort of respect each other uh, and do things our way. Uh, sometimes agreeing, sometimes uh, disagreeing, but always respecting that this is the path that we're going to follow. Would you say you agree most of the time, half the time, or less than half the time? I think that his way, for him, it's the best way 90% of the time. Mm -hmm. He really has a very good sense of who he is, of how he conducts himself and what works for his audience. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I send him a tweet before I tweet because I don't think. <laughs> I just watched some piece of news and someone pissed me off <laughs> and I write a tweet. Sometimes I send before I should. Uh, but when it involves him, I actually send him the tweet to sanitize yeah. and sort of read first before yeah. I tweet it because I trust his judgment. Mm -hmm. For for him, he's right 90% of the time. Well, congratulations because as parents, that's what you want, right? You yes. want your kids to have good judgment. You want them to be confident in who they are yep. and grounded. And so yep. congratulations to both of you for Thank you, thing. thank you. Um, any audience questions? In the room? In the back? to the mic up front so they can hear you. So you've worked on a lot of political campaigns yes. over your whole career. Um, and I think one of the um, sort of slightly more energizing things that come out of this past election is that a lot more people now um, are considering running for office for the first time, or you know, in some communities that haven't traditionally been represented in politics. Um, for people who are thinking about you know, getting involved for the first time, maybe running for office for the first time, what would you have as advice for a first time? Um, that, that they should run. Uh, you know, you get good at repetition. 
when you do the same thing many times, you get better at it every single time. So sometimes you don't win. It really doesn't matter. But you begin to create a machine. You begin to create a cadre of people who help you, who believe uh, like you. You begin to get good at speaking in public, which is something that I'm surprised so many people have difficulties uh, with. Uh, but running, it's, it's like, you know, for my son, it's rehearsing. Mm -hmm. And rehearsing makes perfect. Running makes perfect. And you get better every time uh, you do it. If people have the confidence to do it, they should do it. It doesn't matter if they come in last. There's also name recognition. If you don't have a lot of money to run, and most cities in the country don't have campaign finance where they help candidates with dollars to run, running several times is the best way to be known uh, in, a, in a particular community, but also to be realistic. You know, don't start running for president <laughs> before you run for state assembly. You know, also find your place and what you think makes the most sense at a particular time. But I, I, I believe that uh, running also makes people better and makes more people wanting to be engaged politically. Thank you. Any other audience question? Yes, please come up. You, somebody may need to help you with the mic. <laughs> Hi, my name is Siddharth, and did you encourage um, Lynn Manuel Miranda to get involved with politics? No, uh, <laughs> because I will fail. Uh, and I, I fail at enough things at 62. I don't want to add a big one to my repertoire of, fa of failures. Uh, Lynn Manuel's call in life. It's not elected office. He, if, if, he gets interviewed all the time and he says, oh, I don't like politics. Not true. He <laughs> loves politics. <laughs> because politics, it's the art of getting involved in the day to day and making a difference. And that's what he does every single day. So, but he will never run for elected office, though he will always be involved in politics, particularly in the whole fight for immigrant rights that we are going to have to fight in this country over the next 1,342 days. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. Um, part of yesterday's announcement was uh, uh, the virtual reality um, experience and the six kind of places are that, uh, you know, experiences um, that can bring students closer to the Hamilton experience without leaving their classroom or their home, which I think is very cool. And I think it's a great example of how you can use technology to open up access and opportunity. So how, um, what do you see as like the role of opportunity of technology to open up some of these opportunities to the arts or to um, certain communities who um, may not necessarily have the resources to access or experience certain things? I I'll start by, you know, by saying, um, and that's why we're doing the Hamilton Education Program. Uh, I, I probably told Justin and Daisy a thousand times when we were having discussions of how Google can get involved. There's nothing like an audience in a theater. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that changes that. The connection with the actor, the connection with the audience, the feelings uh, that sort of come out of that relationship in Hamilton for two hours and 50 minutes. It's unique. Uh, but we realize that at the end of four years, 20 million into this initiative, we're going to be able to bring only 200,000 mm -hmm. high school students to the mm -hmm. theater to have that experience. Mm -hmm. So anything that can help bring that experience to many more people, mm -hmm. it's very important. Okay. You know, the, the virtual reality that we just mm -hmm. saw a little bit, it, it's incredible. You know, it's places that I have now visited in mm -hmm. all this Hamilton tour that our lives have become. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I tell people all the time, 
I never realized that this Puerto Rican family was in charge of Hamilton's legacy. legacy. <laughs> <laughs> if someone would have said to me in Vega Alta when I was 17 years old, you know the guy in the $10 bill? You're going to be responsible for his legacy, I would say. Right. Uh, but so seeing the virtual reality of the places that I have now experienced in this Hamilton journey that we have been in for, for a while is a magnificent way mm -hmm. of kids and people to realize this is the house where mm -hmm. Alexander, the only house he owned, mm -hmm. uh, and this is what the house looks like in the mm -hmm. middle of Harlem. Mm -hmm. Because the house is in the middle of Harlem. Uh, so mixing that with interviews, with YouTubes, with the music, it's the second best mm -hmm. to being in a theater and experiencing the magic of an audience actor relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And anything you guys can do, welcome. Great. Other questions? Yeah. Hey, uh, my name is Becca. Um, within my Latin social circle, two conversations that have come up a lot is one, the term Latinx, and then there's this controversy around Justin Bieber showing up on a Luis Fonsi song. And they seem really trivial, but I think underneath is like this struggle of our generation to preserve our roots and like our heritage, but also bend to the needs that we have. And I think it's so important now, especially under this administration, that, that we find a balance. And I'd love to just hear your thoughts on what you do or advice around that topic. Uh, and and I, I start with what I said. Lee Manuel is right 90% of the time for him because he is looking at it from his perspective, from his age cohort, from his reality, and as much as I tried hard to do that, there is always a difference. I'm, I'm the result of my own experiences. And uh, I, I think I'm awesome at trying to understand <laughs> younger people. It's the only way to run campaigns, because you have to begin <laughs> to put yourself not only on your age cohort, though unfortunately so far, they're like 50% of the vote. Uh, that's why people don't think about younger people and younger needs. Because when you look at the electorate, you say, ah, you know what, if I get 60% of the 55 plus vote, I'm home free. Mm -hmm. So as long as we begin to vote like the normal curve and represent it in the right percentage, that's what's going to happen. Uh, and I, I, I believe that more and more uh, you need to preserve history, but you need to show it and present it the way we are right now. And I think that that's the beauty of Hamilton. I remember when I was 18 years old, I went to a Sound of Music performance at New York University. I came here to study. And Maria von, von Trapp was black in this performance because it was student theater and it was avant-garde. And I'm sitting there after seeing The Sound of Music at 18 a hundred times. This is not Maria von Trapp. And it took me a while to wrap my head around the possibility that Maria von Trapp was just an entrepreneur who sang beautifully and tried to save a family. It didn't matter the color that Maria von Trapp was. And that's what Hamilton does for this generation. No longer George Washington, it's going to be a white dude with white hair for generations to come. The most exciting moment of all of this Hamilton trip that my wife and I and my family have gone through was being in the White House, listening to Chris Jackson, a black man, with a George Washington picture, an actual portrait in the back, singing a George Washington song. 
And that's what you're talking about. It's how do we actualize for this generation what our history is. Well, in yesterday's show, all three male leads were black. Yes. And I just, it was not lost on me thinking about all of the kids in the room and just what they must have been thinking, experiencing the show in that way and seeing themselves on stage. And you know what that does, even just for the 200,000 kids who will see it um, you know, and experience the, the show. And in the music, that it's not Broadway tunes. Mm -hmm. So that it's not only uh, that, that they're a multi-color diverse, but they're also singing in the vernacular that young people understand. And it's, I remember for In the Heights, I did a lot of numbers in my head. How long will it run? Mm -hmm. How much to recoup your investment? Because at the end of the day, I'm also a businessman. How much to recoup your investments and all of that. And understanding that the average Broadway theater goer is a 55-year-old woman from suburbia earning an average of $140,000. So when you think about the audiences on Broadway, Hamilton should have never made it. Mm -hmm. But it did. Mm -hmm. And we have sat there, lose a hundred times. I don't even know how many times she has gone. Uh, 106? 36. 36. 36 times. Wow. And we sit there with many people who are like our contemporaries in terms of age, enjoying this feast that cannot be more different from their taste and from their daily living. So there's something special that you can do to bring different people together to appreciate art. And that's one of the things that you're spending time on is how to expand the audiences of, of Broadway, right? To more diverse audiences. Correct. And you know, that only uh, we 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 didn't have a lot of money uh, uh, for Lin Manuel and Lucecita, so we usually went to Broadway once uh, a year, uh, and sort of course we took poor Lin Manuel to see La Mis oh. at seven <laughs> oh because we wanted to see La Mis. <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the day. You know, all the age appropriate that you guys think about today is your bring your kid to school. Ah, we didn't think age appropriate. <laughs> we want to see the maze. We're going to drag them along to see the maze. Uh, so we, we went to see a show like once a year. We had a lot of show tune LPs, uh, records in the, in the house, which is how, how Lee Manuel and my daughter Lucecita learned their appreciation. Uh, but, but it's, it's, it's difficult to dish out the money to go and mm -hmm. see a Broadway show. So anything we could do, we have the Hamilton Education Initiative as part of Viva Broadway mm -hmm. that, that I'm the, the chair from, for the Broadway League. We bring families. Mm. Uh, sort of, we select three shows and then an entire family comes to see uh, the, the shows and, and there is then a talk with the actors at the end, just like you saw yesterday uh, at, the, at the Orpheum uh, here. So any way that we could encourage and give access to theater, we will. Great. Let me just ask uh, if we have other audience questions, go ahead and line up at the mic. Um, the, uh, in the Heights, how many folks have seen In the Heights also? How much of that was based on your experience, your family experience, and, and what he... Um... It was a bit autobiographical. Uh, Chiara uh, Alegria Hughes, mm -hmm. who wrote the libretto, uh, it's partly all also her story. Mm -hmm. uh, she also comes from a Puerto Rican family, but in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. uh, Lee Manuel from, from, from New York. Uh, but when we were looking, we, we were both NYU students, that's where, where we met, and we were living in, in university housing. And uh, when Lin-Manuel was born, we were sort of the typical uh, 
Puerto Rican family, five in a one-bedroom apartment. Uh, we sort of figure out we probably need to get out of here. Uh, if not, they were going to kick us out anyway. <laughs> so when we started looking at neighborhoods, Washington Heights reminded me the most of Vega Alta. Mm -hmm. It was a Latino neighborhood mm -hmm. uh, where people are in every window checking what everyone is doing, <laughs> uh, where everyone is sort of in everyone's business. Uh, where in the bodega in the back, there were slot machines so that you didn't have to go to Atlantic City but there's some illegal way of playing the numbers uh, in the neighborhood. And I said, this, this is my perfect neighborhood. I'm in New York. The A and the 1 come up here, and I could go anywhere in New York uh, with these two trains. Uh, so that was Lee manuels neighborhood. You know, he was there. We moved when he was 1, and that's where he grew up. So obviously, that had an incredible impact uh, on when you see the generational dilemmas that are presented in, in the Heights. Yeah. Question. Hi, so I'm actually asking this question on behalf of my teammate who's in Sunnyvale. Um, her grandmother actually lives in Washington Heights. Um, and so her question is, how can we as Googlers use our products to better connect with the Latino community, um, including for older Hispanic generations like her grandmother, uh, who really don't use social media that much, but and who can't afford to see Hamilton, but who really feel strongly about making a change in the, this political climate? Uh, well, there's people don't have to tweet and Facebook or create content for YouTube. Uh, the, all of that is welcome. And if your grandmother wants to do a YouTube of how much she hates Trump, <laughs> I think we all can agree to retweet. Yes, that would go viral. Well. I think that would go viral. Well. So I will encourage her to do that also. Uh, but I, I think we should use anything we can. I, I remember when we were in the midst of trying to get uh, the US Navy out of Vieques, uh, Puerto Rico, it was a big struggle. Uh, with the U.S. Navy taking this island, which is also a municipality, uh, outside of the uh, East Coast in Puerto Rico. And there were many, many, many fights. And we did a survey to see what people were willing to do, from writing a letter to making a phone call to going to a demonstration to doing a number of things. And what I learned and continue to learn in practice is that you have to meet people where they're at. Mm -hmm. You try to move them to do more. You, you should never be content with just allowing your grandmother to just talk to her friends or talk to them on the phone. You got to push them to do more because that's the only way social change uh, happen. But from in Washington Heights, when it's May 1st, I don't even know the day I'm in. Monday. 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 There's a big rally. Yep. Sunday and Monday. Pro immigrants yep. against Trump. Uh, so if she's in Washington Heights, I encourage her uh, to go to the rally. And people really need to do anything they can do. I thought we had agreed, we have been doing a lot of uh, fundraising in social media. Uh, with sweepstakes, mm -hmm. virtual sweepstakes, and all of that. And uh, we were going to do uh, sweepstakes for ACLU. And then the weekend of the madness occurs in every airport. And ACLU, in three days, gets $25 million from little donations from people who were outraged that this shit was happening. And they just clicked and gave whatever they could. So helping our causes, it's another way uh, in which everyone should participate. Thanks. Justin. I got to move this up for myself. <laughs> Luis and Luz, thank you so much for being here. Um, there were some great tweets yesterday between Lynn manuel and our CEO, Sundar. I wonder if you were CEO of Google for a day, 
how might you steer this ship to bring more equity in the Latino community? And I think about you know, Stephanie's work in DC, the work that we do on Google.org. We'll be together at the Latino Community Foundation Gala tonight. So there's all these ways that Google's trying to lean into the Latino community and do good things. But if you were Sundar for, for a day, how would you try to sort of get this company in? Like what issues, what topics, how would you want us to put our weight behind some of these things? First thing I will do is that I will tweet denouncing Trump. Mm. So that's the first thing, the first item uh, on, the, on the agenda. I, I believe that this administration is so bad that any business that allows a picture to be taken with this pig should be denounced. So it's, it's again, it's, I, that's the first thing I would do. Uh, after that tweet that will take all of 15 seconds, it's only 140 <laughs> characters, <laughs> I still have 23 hours at plus uh, to do uh, other stuff. I think that you are involved in the right issues because every company has to pick their lane. You should not be doing what your lane is not. Whatever company is in that lane, that's what you should be doing. But you should be involved, I be believe, initially in education. Because at the end of the day, education is an equalizer in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, I am who I am, Lin Manuel is who he is, because we got a great public education and less and less their public education opportunities for our kids to be great. It's amazing to me. Oh, God, I wish I could not talk this much about Trump. We'll call him <laughs> X from now on. That X budget costs 0.022% of art, humanities, and history. It's not even a freaking penny in the budget. But they're so mean that they just add a cut for the sake of adding a cut. So education, it's obviously a lane in which you guys have a lot to offer, a lot to offer, because you have so many tools to enhance that process in a unique way that that ought to be your lane. And then content-wise, part is what you should be doing anyway in education, and also checking the times what's happening in the world right now, and do that from the education level. Great. Last audience question. Take the mic down a little bit. <laughs> Not like that tall. Six so, uh, so my question is actually more related to about the Latino community. Uh -huh. So my name is Olga, and I actually run our Latino employee resource group here at, at Google called Ola. And you know, I would love some, some words of wisdom of even sparking this interest inside of our communities. You know, like I think typically we see that there's some people that are very passionate about these issues and others that haven't quite found their place yet. So I would love, hopefully yeah. we have some Ola members watching this too, to hear some words of wisdom. I, I start by probably there's not enough of you Latinos in this company. Uh, okay. And I'll start by saying, uh, if you look at our society, white people marry whites, Asians marry Asians, blacks marry blacks, and once in a while they're intermarriages. But they are the smaller percentage of who we are as a society. And that's what happens. White people hire white people. And you really need to get out of your skin to create a diverse working force. And I believe something that I didn't do that your CEO needs to do is you incentivize your managers for having a diverse workforce. If you have an entire white male force, you're not getting a freaking bonus this year because that is not what we should be doing as a company and as a society. So certainly, there's, I'm sure Ola can use many, many more members. And it's up to managers to do their job. And it's up to us, unfortunately, it really should not be up to us. It should be up to human resources to fill this room with Latinos. But they're not going to do it. Because for the most part, they're white. And they're hiring people who look like them. 
So it's our responsibility to then constantly be saying, hey, I have this friend, I know this person. <laughs> Do you give him an interview, please? I really, she's really good, he's really good. And you plead a little, and you sort of just to ask for, for mercy from, from your counterpart. And then they're good. But then our responsibility is to be great, not mm -hmm. just good, just to be great, to show that we could do the work, that they didn't hand it us some mercy job because we're Latinos, but because we are good in mm -hmm. what we do. And that's our responsibility. When I see a kid who's doing C or B, I'm like, man, you suck. <laughs> you're a bright kid. You should be doing A, and you're doing C. Well, the system, the teachers, oh, God, enough of muletas to explain why we're not as good as we should be. So that's our responsibility, to do that. And Ola, as it is in so many companies, it's really to create the sense, because sometimes you feel isolated. When I went to NYU, oh, my God to a PhD program in clinical psychology, did I feel lonely? Mm -hmm. So, Ola, it's your support system. Mm -hmm. uh, and it should exist, it should have the resources to expand, and I'm glad you're here. Thank you, I, I, I Thank want to you. give a applause to yeah. that. <laughs> And I think just given the changing nature of the demographics of the country, like Silicon Valley and tech can't ignore this issue. It won't fix itself. And I think that, you know, given the fact that one in three children in, uh, in pre-K today are Latino, the, for the first time ever, I think it was last year, more than 50% of new births in the United States were minority. Uh, so this is, this is coming, it's here. It and is, and, 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 and little things like, I, I remember I was in the Nielsen Advisory uh, Council, uh, and uh, they couldn't find Latinos. Every time someone <laughs> tells me that they cannot find Latinos, I want to shoot that person, because I never want to <laughs> shoot myself. I want to shoot that person. Uh, then I looked at the universities where they were recruiting from. I'm like, you got to be joking. Mm -hmm. There is an association of Latino, where Latino students are 40% or more of the graduating class. The same thing in the African American community. Just begin to look at those other universities and begin to look at the world differently. It doesn't have to be the Ivy Leagues only. Many of these universities turn out great students. Mm -hmm. So it's little things like that that begin to change the rhythm of what happens in corporate America. And at this one, they did. And then they began to recruit more. And we talked a little bit about this earlier, but how uh, through Hamilton, uh, you know, Lin Manuel's kind of changed the way that we perceive and look at history by who he casts in, in his shows. And, um, and part of you know another kind of key part for Google around the education piece is we work with the entertainment industry to try to change the face of who is playing engineers on television, who's yes. playing scientists. And so a, a Latina can see a Latina engineer on television on you know one of the major networks or on a YouTube or a Hulu show, um, and to see that that can be them too. And I think that that's really important too. That in the kind of mainstream it, media that we see those also change, not it, just on. In fact, way. in uh, in 1982, I was director of research of the National a Action Council for Minorities in Engineering, mm -hmm. NACME. That was before most of you were born. Uh, and the struggle was how do we bring more African Americans and Latinos just into the schools? And schools were willing to admit them. Then how do we keep them there? And how do we assist them in graduating and not feeling isolated? But clearly, uh, media now has this unbelievable impact. Mm -hmm. You know, 
Limanuel says it best uh, that if he wanted to be in a Broadway show, he was going to have to create it because he, if mm. not, he had to be a gang member in West Side Story, mm. in Zoot Suit, or Cape Man. Mm -hmm. Those were the only roles for Latinos, and they were all gang members. So if you don't want to be a gang member, create your own show, and then you could be whomever wow. you want. And entertainment has that power, and you guys have that power to sort of show a very different face uh, of who different communities are. So we're almost at time. Um, I want to show one really quick last yes. clip, uh, and then we'll end a little bit more on a high note here. Just give me a second. This may bring back some memories for you. <laughs> No, there are a thousand of these. I know. <laughs> so this was, um, one. you're right, one of many videos that I, in my research today, uh, or research for today, was looking through. There's also a really great one um, of the push cart. Push the cart push wars, wars. wars that uh, where where he you know that you were the a, cameraman and you Louis were that protester. were a protester and half of the people his. in that video are dead. It's my <laughs> grandmother, and they're dead. But I think I guess my my just question to you to end on that higher note is clearly you guys gave him the space to be who he was and what he wanted to do and, and be creative in your home and and you guys were active participants in that and uh, whether you wanted to be or not. Um, and so, looking back at that, would you, I know that uh, Lynn manuel has talked about how his, how Luce always used to say that he would win an Oscar someday, um, and took you to the Oscars this yes. year, right? Um, and so, would you say, what, when he was that age, and forcing you guys to be his camera person and his actresses <laughs> and his little shows, w did you predict he would be where he was today? Uh, it, it, it's very diff. we always knew that he will be big. You know, we, in my house, we have the two extremes. My daughter is an engineer and a finance person, and so she needed that space, and we needed to give her that space. And Lee Manuel was that dorky guy uh, <laughs> that you saw uh, in that video, and we needed to give him that space. We had to go the full spectrum to make sure that we met them where they they were as, as kids, and we always knew uh, that, that he will be great. You can never imagine that it will be this madness, where we worry if we buy a little house in Puerto Rico, how much security it should have. And we, we never thought that those will be worries of ours mm -hmm. uh, that no longer can he take the subway, mm -hmm. uh, which he loves. You know, he learned how to drive. Literally, he got his license the day before he went to college because he had no other choice. He always took the subway in New York. He's a New York baby. Uh, so to that level, I don't think anybody ever thinks that their kids will be there. I guess if you're very rich and very powerful, you take it for granted. But we both come from humble beginnings, so that was never the expectation. Now we expect that from all of our grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Anything else will be failure. <laughs> so we're going to, just to wrap up, finish with a couple um, fill-in-the-blank questions. Um, that I just want you to say kind of what first comes to mind. For, okay, for that's fine. Um, what's your favorite Hamilton song? Uh, my Shot. Okay. In 10 years, I see Lin-Manuel. Uh, having three kids <laughs> and spending time with them. <laughs> In 10 years, I see the Latino community uh, better than we are today because uh, this new generation has much more cojones than my generation has. <laughs> last question, uh, or last fill in the blank. 
I hope my legacy will be. That the future generations of Mirandas are committed to social change. Mm -hmm. Well, you have done a great job at that. Thank and you. so thank you guys for both being here and for this greater partnership uh, with Google and the Hamilton Wonderful. Education Project. And welcome to Google. Uh, thank you for everybody who came and for those who tuned in. You guys have a cool um, place here. And we can, we can, you can oh, hang out shit. here all day. <laughs> Let's go raise the snack cabinet. <laughs> so thank you.